All right. Yeah, this is Coffee Compiler Club. Uh, anything to do with compilers, and apparently housing and building in Europe versus building in America is also fair game. And type systems and uh, garbage collection and runtimes and concurrency and I don't know what all. I think uh, Alan might have a question about uh, uh, polymorphic types on returns or something. Um, you're being recorded. The videos go up on YouTube in a couple hours. Um, that's it. Uh, I'll do my, my short AA update, which is mostly I'm, I'm crawling out of the, the, you know, the pit of house moving and just starting to code AA again and have got myself back up to the point where I'm running some significant count of the theoretically tests and not any of the real core tests, but that's because I had to hack nil meet other things because the flow system I was using was not tracking nil in exactly the same way as Henley Milner checks nilable. And I needed to unify those two concepts. So I could go down that rat hole a long ways if you want, but if you don't, I'm just as happy to talk about return, polymorphic return types. <laughs> yeah, I see if I can nod, scratch your head. Let's, so, let's go, let's go the ball, the ball for us. If it, yeah, if I'll, don't. I'll roll on a little bit then. So one of the things I can get out of Henry Milner is a type is polymorphically nullable or not for uh, like uh, a collection of nullable objects or a collection of objects that are not nullable. And then if you do a map over them, the map has to handle nil or does it? But Henry Milner may not know anything about what it is nullable or not of. So it might be a nullable collection of function pointers or of structs or of non-zero ints because nil and int work in the sat lattice the same way or whatever. And the, one of the things that comes out of that is I have to have a concept of this thing can be nil, but if it's not nil, I don't know shit about it. I don't know shit in the optimistic way and not the pessimistic way. So there's the bottommost scalar thing that could be nil and maybe it's an an int or it's a pointer or it's a float or it's a function. I don't know what the hell it is. There's the inverse of that that the lattice needs, which is uh, it may be, I, I can choose for the moment, choice of function, pointer, data pointer, every other thing. And then those choices get dribbled away as the algorithm runs and you, you settle down on the correct answer. But I, I must support a nil. And the lattice I had was saying, if it's an or choice, it's nil or code pointer or structure pointer you, or. You mean, a, uh, you mean a nil like a nullable reference? How reference yeah. types can be nil? So, yeah. Yeah. so generally, generally, most of the type system have made the distinction pretty deep. The, they are primitive types that cannot be nil and uh, reference types that can. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and, and for me, nilling on an int or not, turns out to have the exact same infrastructure and theory as everything else. So I just threw it in. Um, but so in your unrelated. type system, it's essentially just a union type, right? Yeah. So, so what I- Like your implementation is, nulls are special because null pointers and whatnot, but- Right, so effectively, right. I effectively had to convert <laughs> to a thing which had one more state in it, which was a, a, a union type of nil and something else which had complete freedom of choice as opposed to something else that I had to compute the hard way because I didn't know what the hell I had. You know, one was an object pointer variety of the Java land versus choice of things or whatever. So I didn't have that representation in the lattice side and I had to go change where I was tracking nil or not tracking nil. And that bumped a Boolean from one point in the implementation structure to a different and everybody had to change to go follow it through. And then it added an extra state in the universe that I didn't have in all of my multi-way switches and they all hit their, you've missed a corner case blow up and I have to go implement something there. It's usually pretty obvious, but it was, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so that's where I'm at with that. Um, it's, it's coming together at a reasonable pace because it's actually really a fairly small change. It's just, there's a lot of code involved. So it, it's, it's taking its time and that I can't get between the damn vaccine knocking me out for a day and moving things running around. We, like we had to go to the old house uh, and fix a bunch of stupid things because 
the inspector came back and said stupid things. Hey, this outlet doesn't work. Well, the breaker got blown by somebody, so I popped the breaker back and the outlet works. This oven piece doesn't light. The range top doesn't light. You know, it's a gas range top. Well, you didn't wait long enough. You turn it on, you wait kind of five, and then it lights. And it's just like, okay, come on, dude. But you have to do it. So it shows up on the disclosure. So the buyer looks and says, oh, it's fixed. Okay, fine. And then, uh, so you mentioned mapping over something that's got nulls in it. Yeah. One of the logical things I might want to do is just like filter those and say, after I do the map, I'm going to get a list that's shorter than the map I had, than the list I started with. And has no nulls in it. Right. Yeah, that was one of the main fails I had with using Elms type systems. I couldn't represent that directly. So that's my question. Does AA need some kind of concept of yield in order to deal with that? Because sometimes I want to map over something and say, here's my function. And sometimes I want to yield no things into the new list. And sometimes I want to yield more than one thing into the new list. Okay, I'm, I'm missing what you mean by yield then. So if I have a standard return statement, I can have a map, which is like, this is a function. It will take in one of the elements and it will return something. And that something will end up in the new list. Right. If I do that, my new list is going to be the same length as my old list. Because yes. for yeah. each thing in the old list, I called the function and it gave you a thing in the new list. Yeah, no, I need, a, I need a map variant that says I don't install nils into the new list. Right. But, so in Python, what you sometimes end up doing is using the yield keyword and say, I'm going to call this function that returns nothing. But every time I yield along the way, the thing that I yield is going to end up in the new list. And now if I never call yield before I hit the return statement, then I just don't stick anything in the new list. And if I call yield three times, I step three things in the new list. So now I get the ability to map from a list to a new list, but the new list doesn't have to be the yeah, same size where it produced right. one to one. Right. You have to have a filtering list. It's no no question that that's a useful yeah, I think thing. what Aaron means is, is basically uh, a coroutine where you can stop the execution or turn something in between. Right. And, and, and so I, what I was trying to sort out, and I haven't figured out if if I have, I have that kind of behavior baked into the return and the, the loops. So the loops right now are all functions. Every loop, every for loop is the body is a function. And there is an early return. Um, but if the body is uh, uh, building the map itself, then the early return does exactly what you said on Python. If the wrapper around the function body is building the list, then that wrapper has to be smart about filtering or not. Right, like at what point, I have a map over a, a function body do shit. The map does some work. The functions that are getting one per element do some work. If the guys doing one per element are also appending onto the new list, your early exit does exactly what you get out of Python. You bail before you insert the body. And is that the coding style that you wanna do for that kind of problem? And then there's another version of that says, I have a map over a list, but if the return value meets some predicate, I don't put it in the list. So any predicate filtering list, map and filter. And the filter is not nil, right? So in the case of mapping, I believe that null checking and option flat mapping are overlapping here because we have to have something uh, you can filter on. So in the new case, is it new? And the option case, is it non or some? Yeah. And now what, what coding style do you want to do for this kind of thing? Map and filter. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know what the right answer is. It has to be there. Yeah. I just don't know what the right answer for doing that one. Does that sort you out, Aaron? Like, how do you want to deal with that? So that gives a good answer for, I want a shorter list than the list I started with. It doesn't necessarily give a good answer for, I want a longer list than I started with. Yeah, so, so things that do sort of arbitrary, as soon as you get out of the common cases, I'm gonna set you back to the, go to the primitive world. Where you just you write just, yourself a for loop that yeah, does the thing. Yeah, yeah, and he appends as he discovers things. Right. You can imagine, man, I do a lot of work list style algorithms and you pull something off the work list, do some work, the work puts more things on the work list. So, you know, that, that kind of a loop, you have to think about it not as a map of a collection, it's a pile of work and you're pulling one off, putting two on, pull one off, put two on, put two oh. off, 
you know. Does mapping create a new collection? Does it create a copy of a traverse? Oh, uh, well, I, I support side effects. So I'm going to allow you to update in place directly if you ask for it. Hmm. But if you want to have a new mapping, you can. Um, so this goes uh, to the convenience versus performance in a big way. It's really easy course. to shoot yourself in the foot for performance. Of course. It's also really easy to think about these things as a holistic collection. And I just want to like do something, get a new collection back. If I can show in the language level with some sort of rust like if lifetime prove, management allocation, mm -hmm. uh, there's an update in place option. Yeah, if can prove, we can just update. The, yeah, the, and, the, yeah, right. And would like to have the type system be able to prove it mm -hmm. sort of relatively straightforward. Like you can help it or not or so, something. So it has to have it has to has it has to track the side effects. So uh yeah, I'm tracking side effects now. I sort of, sort of in my head, it's unrelated to mm -hmm. what I just said, which was, I'm going to say lifetime. I pull an element out of the collection. Somehow I, I view the lifetime that I'll never pull again out of that spot. And though I can put a result back in it, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, if you do the whole collection and when I'm done with the whole map, I have the new collection, the same length as the old collection. Now I want to replace this and update in place. And I want to have it in the type system so the user can say, this better update in place. I'm going to write it as if it's a standard map producing a new object. And also at typing time, I'm going to prove that it'll update in place. And if it won't, then I get a compiler error that says, change something how you're doing this, or if you want it to update in place, or admit you're going to get a new object, good new allocation. So you have to have to pretty clearly ask for it. So in your case, uh, the sudden performance, if you can, if sudden, if type system suddenly cannot prove the object, it has to have the make the copy. So the user it's have a, to be aware of it. It's a type error, not a performance, not, not a silent performance loss. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I'm mostly in the zone of, uh, I want modest changes to be turned into type errors, not silent performance hits. Mm -hmm. So you certainly you tripped over something like that in Scala where there was a collection dot map function dot map function dot map function dot map function. It's like seven maps in a row and suddenly make one tiny tweak to one of those functions and it can't prove that there's no side effects. And uh, suddenly instead of going through the collection once and applying the five functions, yeah. it goes through it five times and applies each function because you've lost the optimization. Right. And right. now your caches hit you again. Yes, yes. Is this, is this in a vanilla Scala? Because uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the normal uh, version of Scala never did this optimization. The, if you okay. wrote five maps, it uh, builds the list five times. At least it can, at least it what it should have do to transform one uh, mapping five times into a function that you can chain it and apply all the functions in one map in one go. So you can give um, it. Yeah, it was never done. Um, the the mm -hmm. reason for that was that it would uh, change the side effects, uh, the order of side effects, and that was considered to be not acceptable. Well, I, I, so. Does this right here and say he, he lost the ability to prove no side effects? So if you knew there were no side effects, did the Scala ever do anything with it or they just never, never tried? No, that there were some experiments with macros and compiler plugins and stuff that tried to do that. But I think without the language buy in, it, they were all dead on arrival. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm curious where my magic was coming from, if not the standard language. <laughs> well, so, yeah, the, so I, the, I will guess the inlining, the JIT. The yeah, I must say the JIT can come along and inline and do things to you. Hmm. Now, as far as I know, he's not doing loop fusion, which is what you just said. Um, but I haven't been at Sun a long time. And simple, straightforward loops, uh, the compiler certainly reaches a point where it would be possible for it to do loop fusion. The JIT, not the Scala, the bytecode, but the bytecode mm. machine code. You'll You're happy to give up some of that loop fusion to have your maps be side effecty. Uh, no, no, I would happy to have both. That is, the, the fusion will work if your maps are not side effecty. And if you're side effecty, then it's more difficult, as people point out, to show that fusion doesn't change semantics. So you bail, maybe, right? So, so but there's a, there's a continuum here of, this one, I confuse these loops and life gets better. And then this one, 
because you have some side effects and I can prove that they're okay, I'll let them fuse anyhow. And then I have one where I have side effects where I'm not certain and I can't tell. And then maybe there's side effects, which I prove myself that will actually be bad. You know, you just can't do that. <laughs> so there's some sort of transition where you could go from, it fuses, it's great. And to, I quit. And then, you know, when did I quit and why did I quit? And if I care, then I would like to get a type error saying, you're not getting fused here. Do you want to do something about it? Either quit caring that you don't get fused or deal with it. I know the vectorizing compiler guys, so supercomputers of your worked a long time on bringing why you fail to fuse loops uh, back out to the end users. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious if that work is in any way reusable. I'm not aware of it. So. I guess that in uh, in many cases, um, adjusting the semantics was just simply an easier approach. So if you're saying the order of side effects isn't defined, or if you're doing it like Java saying the order of side effects is the uh, order that is actually implementable in a fast way, then you don't have to deal with all the things uh, Scala managed to get itself into. Right. And, I mean, I'm talking about like straightforward old school supercomputer vectorization hacks, which is this loop has some side effects, but I can prove they all go into some array that when I run this loop, which all does side effects, doesn't stomp any of these. Like this guy outputs to some array, this guy outputs to a different array. I can fuse these loops and intermingle these and after the sum of both loops are done, the side effects are the same. Now, one of the things that comes out of that is you can't stop in the middle of the two loops um, and like throw an exception and then catch that exception and have somebody look because the arrays will be out of order and not, not represent any final execution point. So that, now you know, that, that turns into when am I allowed to stop the execution and abort? Right, but I have to prove that the list doesn't abort. I can stop for garbage collection, claim the stores are out of order um, because the GC doesn't care and you're not supposed to know. And if you have a racy guy looking, he'll see the writes come out of order, but he would see the writes out of order anyhow, although you can be arbitrarily out of order. But at the end of this second loop, um, all the writes are done and none of them have been dropped. You should be able to fuse. And again, at the end of the second loop, which is also the end of the first loop, you're good to go, except in between, the rights all got scrambled. So that, that's the question, can you prove, as long as I can't halt in the middle. So you're not allowed to throw in exceptions. So and now you have to throw, prove yourself you're not throwing an exception for both loops. That's actually probably doable still. Same way with range checks go. If you don't do anything crazy that could throw an exception, you have no, the hot inner loops of typical hotspot jitted code after all the ring checks are done, really do have no bailouts to deopt, which that's the fail point. So if you had two such loops where you did safety checks, hot loop, no bailouts to deopt, some cleanup, second loop with safety checks, hot loop, move all the safety checks up front for both loops. Um, uh, you'd have to- Yeah, I might do that and just document the but if you, from another thread, stop this thread, you get what you get. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. No, that's that's the that's the. You know, if you're effectively control yeah. saying uh, from another thread, like. Yeah, I, I would I would claim in a in a in another language I wouldn't let you do that. You know, I can throw a thread dot death from one thread to another. Um, it it has a useful resource management for some master thread trying to control some slaves that have gone hog wild and crazy and you're trying to shut them down. <clears throat> but bounding the, the space of their updates is difficult. And if you have- Yeah, a, I mean, I've definitely had those moments where like you start the thing and you didn't realize that the file was four gigabytes and not four kilobytes and now it's gonna run forever. You would like to be able to kill that. <laughs> right, and not without killing the whole JVM. You wanna kill it, right, this is, you know, Cameron's containers kind of thing. So as soon as you proclaim side effects get further and further, you can't stop in the middle or you blow side effects. And now is there a way to say in the language, like, I don't care. 
if I halt you in the middle, I'll live with side effects being crappy. It's, you know, the usual point of stop in the middle is I'm gonna to go to some higher level place in the program to do my recovery. I mean, you could have a semantic that's, hey, if you stop in the middle of this thing, you just get a null pointer for the whole arrays. Like I blew the whole thing up. Oh, so you can't see side effects because all the memory of the thread you nuked is gone. Well, thread.def or throwing a thread.stop on a thread doesn't nuke the thread. It can be restarted. So that's, that's the, other, and, the and the arrays can be shared. So here's two large shared arrays. I'm going to run this for loop over some other stuff and write in the first array. And then I'm going to run the second loop and write in the second array. And if I fuse them, then I write the, the two arrays interleaved as opposed to all of one and all of the other. Okay, fine. Then if it turns out the fusion has performance gains and they can typically have a lot, as you pointed out, side count a loop, whatever, number of loops fused. Um, maybe you're excited to love that, live with that. And then if you thread that death in the middle, you get this higgledy piggledy mess of the side effects. And, and now what, how do you specify the semantics? The semantics are in a loop which you have proclaimed is say orderless or free order. I have a for loop, I have a while loop. I proclaim that I'm doing a collection over something with side effects. The side effects are unordered. The loop execution elements are unordered. Side effects are unordered. At the end, you'll hit them all, but in the middle, you get some or a little of this, a little of that, or whatever. No one knows. Yeah, I can do that. There's a semantic there. It says all mappings over collections are unordered, including their side effects. And if you want strict, strict, you have to ask for it. And if you want strict, you ask for it. Yeah, so it's yeah, so two different mapping calls. There's an in order one, which you said for i equals zero to blah, you're in order. You said map some function over some collection, you're not in order. And if you have side effects, they're not in order. Yeah, and if instead of map, I say left map, like no for serious, run this thing from the left to the yeah, right. Yeah, yes, right. You had some way to say. Yeah, yeah but order. you. For a map, we implicitly expect the order to be unchanged. No, I certainly. I mean, the, the maybe. Rule. I certainly think there's a lot of programming languages that spell left map map in the way that they spell left fold fold. But yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. that's true. That's true. You, know, if you decide you want to distinguish left map from map. Fine. You want to have a different syntax to say I want an ordered and I want an unordered. I don't care about order. Okay. Certainly, in the land of H2O, I got terabytes of data across clusters. You're not, there's no ordering on the outputs, but you definitely had outputs. So they were all unordered, and you just hmm. knew that. But I want a language semantic that said, run this loop in order. In fact, I would say the standard map would be unordered. It would say that. And if your collection is big enough, he would promptly fork threads. Yeah. If my map wants to go off and do a map reduce like thing, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. If my left map wants to go off and do a map reduce thing, sorry, you said to do it in this order. You said left map. You're you're yeah. You're running in order, right? You, I I declare I have uh, I, I understand I want my side effects in order, right? Which means if you use standard map and you use side effects in your writing, oh look at this, somebody's oh the chat hit something. Da da da, da, da. execution poly this is from Matt. Um, yeah, that, that's why we why don't we even specify it that though it's a bit bulky. So you may want to specify that you want this for each loop, for example, oh, to execute sequentially, but also unsequen unsequenced. That's already necessary for SIMD vectorization. So you don't even you don't even need to go concurrency or parallelism to introduce policies. Even if you want SIMD vectorization, you may want to chunk the data into groups. And of course, you may also want to have parallel policy when you completely don't right. guarantee anything about the order. But I'm still not sure about the ergonomics. I'm not sure I have seen any language that really gives you this choice, but also is easy okay. to use at the same time. But let's go pull up the, the, the doc sheet here. Let me hit the share. I mean, the obvious one is you say map, which runs in parallel, and for loop does not. Um, let me find the share here. Um, okay, yeah, no, 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 no. Hey, there we go. Oh, somebody's been doing return time. Oh, <laughs> all right, Alan, we will get to yours. That's definitely going to be there. I'm, I'm on the new section here, which I'm doing. Um, map is going to be uh, uh, 
you know, a, a function and a collection, it's going to return me back, whatever, I guess uh, I'll do this in AA syntax. And it does something, it's going to return me a new collection and this will be uh, unordered, side effects in order, yes, yeah, side effects. And instead, I, uh, not, not look at this map, or let me do a use here, map of two upper case and a collection, you know, where the collection is or whatever. It has no side effects in that one, so who cares? And a for loop where I have side effects in order, where I'm gonna say, uh, I equals zero, I less than 100, I plus plus. And then the body is something like A sub I plus equals I or something stupid, I don't care. I'm trying to do something side effecty, this one's not a good one. But, but the point being that the one of them clearly, the for loop clearly specifies an order because it says for I equals zero, I plus plus, right away you've got an order. And the, uh, the map you can have, you can just imagine the defaults are it's parallel. Immediately. And that, that would be my proposal on how to say sequential versus parallel. And instead of left map as a map that's sequential, is that Boy, well, everyone got really quiet. Thank you. Thank you. Face. There we go. So here to uppercase, you pass the collection in line, but what if you're referencing it multiple times? Is the type ah, system has to pass, pass the, the track? Pass yeah, the but in. yeah, but if you if you have if you want to support the case to map over only one collection, if it doesn't change it anywhere in the code, so it doesn't result in an extra copy. And so have, right. So so this case I would say map defines to being gives me a, a, some new map, some upper map, whatever. My map is an upper map. Um, because map is defined sort of conceptually to return you a new thing that is not the old guy. So let's, let's go ahead and make an example here. Right. So, yeah. and then the question is, can I do an update in place mm -hmm. if I can tell you that I want it to update in place and I want a typing annotation that says, no side effects, update in place, or give me a type error. Mm -hmm. This is a thing that I want to have and I don't know how to specify it right now. Mm. And I, I can keep, think of a couple of good or bad ways. You know, map update is, is the update in place one, right? And, and he does whatever he does. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, he, he takes your side effects for free and doesn't give you an error. He simply, yeah. he simply does the side effects in place and whatever that turns into. But, um, so that's another, a different semantic yet again. Yeah. Another route you can take if you specify, let's say, a map operation, you automatically get two, uh, two sub operations that are based on a map, based on the order, based on an order. So you, you and in your example, you just prefix it with what operation you you would like, uh, because because if you don't specify it, you have to define the three operations. If you it will be duplicated if you the ordering matters for some application. I, I'm looking for a way to say I'm a normal map. Think about me as a normal map, except know that I can, I am allowed to update in place and that I get a hard guarantee that I'll get the update. You say, you say this on the definition side, not on the U side, on the definition of a map, of the map operator. You say- Yeah, it, yeah. so I changed it, the name to map update, which is not the same one. Oh, I want a version of a map that has a name change. I'm using name change as a way to add a type annotation, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so a version of a map that says, um, 
give me an error if I can't update in place. Mm -hmm. So track mm -hmm. side effects in your function and give me an error if I can't update in place. But my question is, do you have to define the map operation and a map update as a different operation? You have to define it twice or you, you just get the prefix as a kind of com compiler sugar above it? Well, what do you mean by prefix? Uh, I'm here, the map operation specifies with, and uses it with, the, with its arguments. Right. Here, map update, is it a different operator defined it somewhere in the yes, class? Yes, it's a different operator defined somewhere. Which, which specifies which it has the semantics to update in place. Yes. And that's how I understand. Yes, it. so it expects a, a collection and it will update that collection directly. But you have to define the two operations twice separately. Yes, there's two separate operations. One returns that's a new thing, right. one updates in place. Yeah, that's what my. And I'm not claiming this is the good answer. I'm claiming I'm sorting around what's the right answer here. So it, it will turn out with the three definitions of a map map that the, uh, doesn't update in place, map doesn't, uh, the, does not update in place, and three that would lead to code duplication. That may be not necessarily a bad thing, though. Yeah, but in the libraries, this kind of code duplication I don't care about mm -hmm. because the, what they'll, they'll end up sharing under the hood common iterator technology. Although in this case, map the iterator technology over standard yeah. collection yeah. Tri trivial yeah. it doesn't matter. The, the, the iterator is no question at all. You have to use you. You should be able to use it with whatever map operation you'd like to. You just oh, have yes. to. Have Every time there's a different kind of a map. Yes, this is why I don't like this particular solution all that much. Every time I have a different kind of mapping operator. So if I have a map over arrays, it's all great. Mm -hmm. But if I have a map over dictionary, I need a different iterator. Mm -hmm. right? If I map update on the different dictionary, I actually need to support, you know, the collection has to support updates or not. Yeah, but the the right answer here is the map should be defined on the iterator for some something to iterate to avoid to specify the map for each collection. And here in your example, in your language, will be easier because you have to, you don't have to specify the type. Uh, you have to, you can just specify the operations you want to support, and the map should be pass it. And if you pass a collection, if it does, if it does has. If it does has these uh, operators, then it's all good. You, map you can pass. Needs, right, map needs the collection thing to support an index operator and a length operator. Yeah, and, you and can... if you're the make a new kind, then it needs to have some sort of append to. Mm -hmm. And if you're updating place, it has to have some sort of assign into. But you can leave it. Uh, the, you can leave it at this state, and you can pass the, the the list. You can pass the dictionary as long as they had defined this operation. You can avoid right. this because you can partial partially. Uh, well, match. I require the collection to have a certain set of operators it supports, which yeah, I yeah, do yeah. right now. I mean, I don't for know. the most languages, this uh, this is a, a iterator as a minimum. If, if the any collection, either the dictionary or the list implements an iterator, you can you can use a map operator that is defined on the iterator operation. Wow, people are bumping mm. around here. It's <laughs> fine. So, so yeah, I wanted to mention the the Coca programming languages. I put a link in K O K A. Um, so they have this thing called functional but in place, which is where you write your algorithms. Like they, uh, like they all create copies, but there's this optimization that makes them work in place. Mm. And so, how this optimization is specified? Does it automatically does this? Uh, well, it's based on reference counting. Mm -hmm. So, I, um, it, it basically, if there's one reference to the array before you call the function. And then it's the same size and so on. Then mm -hmm. it'll reuse the array. Mm -hmm. so. And and the question is, do you get it as a compiler op runtime optimization, like tail call elimination, as a hard guarantee? Yeah, yeah, no, that's what they say. Is it's like tail call elimination, and it's a hard guarantee. So. And they're more complicated than just arrays. I'm looking at. I've seen this before. Um, so. huh. 
So they're, they're just showing that they're getting it turned into a yeah. into an update and place algorithm for tree for red black trees or something here or something really complicated. All right. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if it's if it's stable enough to use in a programming language. Well, it's not. Uh, I, I wouldn't. Right. OK. Uh, yeah, I was supposed to, I wouldn't do. I would want to have a thing that I could specify at a type annotation, either by saying map update or not or some some way that if it couldn't update in place, I get a compiler error. Um, but otherwise, conceptually, I want to think of it as a map. So functional, but in place, exactly the, what Coco people are saying. And then the right. tracking of one versus zero references at typing time is actually fairly straightforward. When you go to many and then you want to count off many, you, you're in trouble. But if you just ever had one and it went to one to zero and one to zero, you can track that pretty easily. Yeah. I guess there's a zero, one, many. So it might be doable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they wrote a paper and, you know, you can read the paper if you really want to see how they do it. But um, I mean, I, I, I think the idea is, is sound, at least you can, I don't know. Because I was reading these really old papers from the 80s that talked about how to do in-place array mutation. And like, they don't even use reference counting. They just like say, are there any evaluation orders that do the reads before the updates. And so then they always do the reads before the updates. And then it, when they're up, when they're updating, they can avoid the copying if they, by reusing the array. This is a long, yeah, there's a long history of this stuff. So. There's a lot of um, like array of short, right? Image processing back when memory was tight and you mm -hmm. held the image, but you couldn't hold a copy. You want to do a stencil calculation for an edge finder thing would roll through or, or get rid of pixel bits or whatever, you know, D, D, whatever they call it. There's a get rid of the camera errors for individual pixels. You would just do an averaging over neighbors. But then when you compute a new value for a pixel, you update it straight into the map, into the array, the, the image, and you rolled on, which meant that the next pixel you looked at took the effect of the left pixel you just updated. And uh, it was always tricky to make that work how you wanted it and so there was various amounts of people doing things that were you know more or less clever to try and get a clean run but that was it was always a, a, a you know how far can we push this one and you can go some ways on it all right are we, are we done with ordered versus unordered maps I have one other thing I want to throw out for maps. I think by default, I'd like my map to be parallel and it will it will run all the elements unordered technically. And in practice, you have to be unordered from the beginning. Some uh, deterministic order, so you're reproducible, but not left to right. And even your default beginning case, because people will immediately rely on it being ordered. So you want to start out by doing something stupid like inside out, any order, you know, start in the middle, run to the end, go to the beginning, run to the middle, any as, order, not left to right. As in Scala, I would expect the map to be the right or the same order for the for the collection. Yeah, see, Chris shaking said no, no. If you want <laughs> to support ever case that you have a default parallel operator for some of these things. Mm -hmm. The operator must start out right away doing something that is not left or right because the third person who writes the program will write one that depends on the order. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then as soon as they get screwed up a few times, everyone will clue in and, and they'll deal and life goes on and it works. Didn't, <laughs> then didn't, parallel can come later. Actually, parallel can come later. Didn't Python try this uh, this uh, non regular iteration approach? Where they first had uh, uh, iteration in a in a known order, and then they started telling people to not rely on the iteration order, and then they made it random, and then they decided, well, 
that's pretty user friendly and then they gave up and simply specified that uh, the iteration order is fixed and it's this order and uh, now it's now they just give the guarantee I, I don't know it sounds like a, a good war story I'd love to hear and see the docs on that one you know, if you're if your default iterator is already uh, uh, supporting the easy one to grab is moving from ordered left to right to some other order. I think you're in trouble already. It's too late. Everyone's grabbed the easy one already, the obvious for loop, and they're already depending on the order. And you, the, the barn left the horse. Your the horse left the barn. You're done. Yeah, as far as I remember, they I think it was uh, the fixed uh, iteration order for maps. Yeah. So now every hash map is a linked hash map in JavaScript. Oh, geez. No. I, to be honest, I think we have the same things for something in Java where, every, where the documentation said, don't rely on the order. And the order was always correct the way you expected it unless you used another implementation and then people got screwed. Um, uh, you, uh, reflection would return yeah. fields in, in theory in a random order. And in practice, it was always a particular right. order for a long time. Right. And then one rev of the, of the JVM returned them in a random order as the spec said, and there was much screaming and crashing of programs. And they went, then they changed the spec to say it's alpha sorted now. And that's actually fine. Everyone's everyone grumbled and then they changed the handle alpha sorted, but they had to have it sorted because you know you change the hash map implementation, this holding on to the fields, and then you have a hash map iterator in the JVM itself, nothing to do with the Java code. Yeah. Is, and there and there is a point. If you use something, you come to rely on it. It yeah. doesn't matter what the spec said. So I want to be parallel maps to be unordered from the get-go in the hard way. <laughs> And if you don't like that, unordered, you need to be using the for loop version. But I, I think the problem is it doesn't matter what the doc says. If you try something, it matches your expectation. You think you're right. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the right answer. I mean, yes. Which is why I want it to not match your expectation from the get-go. So you change your expectation after you take the you know school of hard knocks. All right. Oh yeah, there was also um, C++, like it, it does a stable sort and an unstable sort. And the unstable sort, if you shuffle the elements before you do the sort, you get a different order out of the sort. And apparently like a number of programs have like depend, they, they, they have dependencies on the sort order, like the, or what, what it was before and after. It's a different algorithm. Stable sort is a completely different algorithm than standard regular sort. Think of Excel. Think of Excel spreadsheet when you would like to sort the spreadsheet column by column by column. You do not want to destroy the previous column sorting order just because you have sorted the next column. So this is a very common operation, but it is also more expensive than the regular sort. Yep. The problem is that the sort order for the unstable sort if you're sorting equal elements is not defined so yeah. you can get either order and it's correct yeah but, I've, I've totally yeah seen lived with this and dealt with stable versus yeah. unstable sorting yeah, yeah. and um, well, like the java sort came stable pretty early on the standard sort it's wait tim sort or something they they, they figured that one out All right, we're gonna, we're gonna ask her, ask uh, Alan's question here. Return right. type overloading. I moved up to the return type overloading section. Okay, return type overloading. Yeah, so, um, well, let's see. So, okay, so it, it's in a few languages. Like this one here is Swift because I like the Swift syntax the best. <laughs> it's really complicated. Um, so like you have an integer type and you have a string type and they're both returned by this function get something. And then, um, and so then when you call the function, it the type gets specified and you get different results depending on- So you have type. an overloaded, same named function overloaded different returns. Yeah. Usually you use the arguments to decide. Here, of course, the arguments are all the same type because there are no arguments. 
Yeah. And so the question is, well, how do you do this in a dynamically typed language where you don't have uh, types for functions? You just have, you know, the functions short. that return values and they're just completely untyped. Uh, the short answer is you can't, I believe. Right. So yeah, you're talking statically typed, you're talking dynamically typed. Yeah, so it's it's a very it's a paradigm shift, um, paradigm shift. Yeah. So um, and so what I concluded was you well you just make it non-deterministic. You say you have an assertion function which just throws an error if it's not the right type, and you could do that in a dynamically typed language because you know the types of values. Mm -hmm. Um. And so then you you have these assertion functions, and what happens is that both both of these cases get executed in this first line. And the hey function is not of type int. So it throws an error and gets discarded. And so you still get the two. And so, uh, really, so you, you're brute forcing your way through? Is that your answer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the answer is, is brute force. So what do you say? I missed, I missed you, something here. You call. You, I put the annotation. What function would we call here? Yeah, so this is this is the essential. Yeah, so if you don't put the annotation, then you get an error at runtime where it says <laughs> the program is ambiguous because yeah, yeah I mean, oh, yeah. runtime error for ambiguity. Yeah. Oh, so dude, we, you know JavaScript, right? None is not a function. I don't go there. Mm -hmm. Are we going to work on your, your spelling here? Some French, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Some yeah. French American <laughs> the... bastardized spelling. Yeah, yeah. ambiguous. Yeah, I've, uh, I'm totally right. toast. So it's ambiguous. Wouldn't be the answer more like you internally create different function names depending on what you, what you see as a re return value? Yeah. And so, like, I mean, the easiest way to, to, to do this is to just like give the type as an argument. So, so then like, you don't have, you don't, but, but that defeats the point of return type overloading. Then you're not actually, you're just overloading by another right. argument. You're not I'd, I'd love to see a use case for when you want to do something that's only disambiguated by the return type. I guess there's like people who do sort of free injections into, from one type to another conversion things. I want to convert my my float to a double precision, my int to a float. And my I, float I could to I could see something when you when you work with JSON uh, values where you have like just a get function and you get whatever is the actual value in the JSON object. Ah. So you basically overload it, and whatever is executed is the right thing to do. Well, you we, you okay, but it, type assertion, but it's. It's awkward still. <laughs> okay. I'll agree with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure for me, I, I, I'll stop and throw a, you're being ambiguous here. And yeah. not even, as soon as you but did I, the second get something, I'm gonna blow out at you. That's the, you, can, you can afford this in a static. Yeah, static, static, static language come along and say, no, 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 no. But I have totally seen a function with dynamic types, which rely on types changing and keep reusing the variable, if you will. And that would be pretty hard crash with something if you call a function with one type and you expect it in another type. Well, it's, somebody has to do the type checking on the fly as you go. Yeah. Uh, so you, and, you actually just needed the colon int to figure out which of the two guys you're getting. A type ascription would, would resolve. But... Well, that's what I'm trying to sort out here, is get something, the bare not annotated get something, is that an annotation or an inline function call that you've defined above? A colon type is? Oh, uh, well, it's it's like a, fu it's a function, the, 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 the annotation. I mean, okay. It, it's okay. Like it's, so, it's just so... a function with funny syntax. So if you encounter a type here, then it's probably dynamic. So because the type system would allow you to say such a thing. Yeah, <laughs> like I mean, I can change it to like a check type function. I, it's fine, but it kind of tells me that the semantics are you call the first get something that you found, which returns an int. And then at the second line down there, you call get something and you got back an int. 
Yeah, you don't have to do that. I got it now. Okay. And then the third one, you call something, you, you call the first get something, get an int. It's not a string. Now you throw an exception. Like the semantics are you define many get something, you only ever call the first one. When, when can you actually call the second one? No, no. What happens is you call both of them and then like the, the you you mm. and you, you run them until they all fail or they I, get okay. Beaten. I get it, although I didn't believe it the first time I heard you say that. You're saying run them all. If I get an answer I like, keep it and stop. And then if I don't get an answer I like, and then I'm going to blow up saying I didn't find anything. I called 17 get somethings. They all return variations of persons and peoples and countries and states and yeah. whatever, but none of them return in. None of them return a string, so you're dead. Who, who honest, needs, who needs a like JavaScript with you? Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. <laughs> But the point is that because it's a dynamic language, you don't care about efficiency. Like if you cared about efficiency, you'd use a static language and the, the type inference would kick in. And I, I claim there's a different issue here. And that's if I'm writing these, I still care about easy to understand, easy to look at, right? I, I know what the hell it's doing at the moment I stare at it. And I'm not mm -hmm. certain that I would know what happens here the moment I stare at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this feels a bit like the come from of typing. Oh, so it's, yes. So it's like it's, it's from made. somebody is it Rust or somebody does a from type. No, oh, I mean somebody. the 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 opposite of go to come from. Yeah, right. So uh, and uh, it's, it's it feels like it's it's making uh, uh, it's making life hard for <laughs> no observable uh, uh, yes. benefits. Right. So, so he, here would be my question. I mean, if it's the dynamic language and your variable is probably dynamic typed, how would you know what the right answer is if you search for it? Yeah, that was yeah. what I said earlier. You, you no, just no, I, can make it like anything you like. Okay, eliminate all the incorrect answers. And the one that yeah, but how would you know what the correct answer is if your variable is not typed because it's dynamic? Well, because mm -hmm. the incorrect answers give type errors. So like, um, I mean, how, how, yeah. if there are no types? Because he's doing check type. Yeah. So the, I believe the deeper, the, pro, the more deeper problem here is that the print doesn't prefer, it doesn't, it doesn't care. Yes, it doesn't care to... which one he gets either. And I wrote in the second line, uh, in the last line, if you expect an int, it probably can disambiguate that it have to, you have to right. have an implementation that returns an int. And I would claim that the colon syntax for me, colon means here's a type. So the colon syntax was you, Doing a type annotation to specify which yeah, something yeah, I wanted. Yeah, that's uh, done almost the same in our languages. Type prescriptions is just prescribing on the type. Right, but okay. as soon as I say colon in every time I want to use a thing, mm -hmm. I'm going to want to say just change the name from get something to get something int. Yeah, that's what probably works mm -hmm. too. And yeah, this this really looks like a maintenance nightmare where you have like. A, <laughs> Uh, functions and then someone else adds uh, so, that's a function with the same name and then you have to start adding these expect type uh, thingies yeah. in random yeah. places until things work again so yeah. in short if you don't have a type it's a nightmare to maintain well, see, Absolutely. Like, i want to make here with this get something plus get something is that like if you have to specify the type on the get something then you have mm. to write if, if you have a more sophisticated yeah. algorithm, you, well, you can. There could be two different get somethings that you're expecting. One returns an int, one returns a float. And I can't, yeah. as the compiler, I can't tell which one you intend. Or as the so, language execution, I don't know which one you intend. Here you, mean, can, you cannot disambiguate it because the plus mean concaten can mean concatenation. Yeah. And the plus is going to widen for me. So now I can legally say I want the get something that returns an int, and I want the get something that returns a float or anything in between, and I can't tell which one. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, see, if it returned a float, then it would add, uh, uh, adding two floats would give you a float. It wouldn't give you an int. So, so you know, because the type annotation says int, that you could exclude the you, float as a possibility. But if you just have like get something plus get something, I mean, what would, what type would that select, right? Would it do string plus int or int plus string or string plus string or 
I mean, they guess it's a JavaScript question. So this is like prologue, it, 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 trial combination. It certainly so is doesn't fail. <laughs> At this right. point, we can still cannot disambiguate it because it can mean a concatenation or it can mean addition if you have- Well, two. right, and then the next problem is that you have to call multiple functions. So you're calling the add function and you're calling get something twice. In the end, there are some combinations of the many overloads on add and the many overloads on get something that return results. Hmm. And as you point I mean, out- it sounds, it sounds like a perfect esoteric language, right? You could do <laughs> anything you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, we should market it as a main, maintainable language, the perfect maintainable language. <laughs> Did I ever show you brain fuck as a language? <laughs> <laughs> oh, th this would be more sin sin uh, sinister, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, at least then you know what you're getting with brain fuck. Yeah. 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 Right. There's, so by the way, I'm Java here. 2000, just in case you guys are interested. The, the what? Java 2000 is an esoteric language where every function has a 99% chance of being executed or something like that. <laughs> like, <Ooh>. Sure. <laughs> we, can, we can live with 99%. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's try to write a program, an unfallible program on fallible hardware. <laughs> that would be brutal there. So back to your question. I don't think there's an answer to that. <laughs> So, so or, or better, there shouldn't be a turn type overloading is what I'm hearing, basically. Coffee it's... compiler club says smack, smack, smack. Don't do that. Mm. Yeah. No, I, think the, I think the real problem is that your return type isn't covariant. I think otherwise it wouldn't be like a real issue. No, I think it's still a real issue because you still have to do the prologue thing of trial combinations. As soon as yeah, you got but not two as functions, bad at least. So you got two, you can go exponential, right? There's no, no reason why we can't stack these things one on top of each other now, any layers deep. Well, the worst case would be exponential because we have to try them all. But if you, yeah. cache, if you cache the type resolution, you will expect the same answer when you call it the first time. And you result, oh. get something would be an int and will be an int from- No, now. well, I don't know <laughs> that, that given your dynamic types, you wouldn't get different set of types input different mm. class of functions or whatever and get different results out. maybe depend on side effects yeah, think, as long as you're returning constants i, I think i think it's okay. can any one function return different types it's, it's stale. like if i if get something rolls a random die roll and returns me a two or a hey according to random die rolls what is that type mm, at, it can be an union of the two types well, all I'm just saying is now, now go sort out what it means to, mm -hmm. you can't catch. So, uh, uh, there is still a way to do this, but uh, you have to resort to a um, dependent type. Dependent type here would suffice because the, depending on the input argument, it will reserve the return, it will fix the return type, depending on the argument that can be resolved. No, I, I call but, it random, mm, no argument. Oh, mm, then I, I don't know. I, I took a, a bite from Dev Rand, which read line noise from the physics of the universe. It mm -hmm. had no state that you could find anywhere in the universe to say that's my input state. In the worst case, it's a union type. Right. But well, we, as soon as you I mean, have more units, a... it's the same problem. You get exponential right away. Um, does uh, dynamic languages, uh, Python, have a union type? I believe you do, but I'm just asking. Python have a union uh, type? Um, but I think only with type hints. I, I mean, uh, uh, Python has one type and it's a union of everything possible. Uh, yeah, it's one type that it's every type, I believe, but you can, can you specify a union type? I, I, think you, I think you can actually do that with the new type hint stuff mm. in Python 3, whatever, or mm. lost track. Mm. But why would you need a type union? Because you can make every type you want. Hmm. Um, because with the type hints, the idea is that you bring some kind of static anal analysis into Python, hmm. <laughs> right? Oh, I, it's, oh. I, I mean, it's like TypeScript for JavaScript. Yeah, so right. Bring yeah. what you miss. So, so in the end, the type would, would win. We have, a, we have moved to a type of language. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of folks trying to doing types on Python. The other one, of course, is performance out of Python. And 
Hmm. They go to types, maybe they're looking for performance fine time too. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really interested whether this year's effort to make Python fast will fizzle out or will. Oh, is there another really... effort? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like um, the usual getting rid of the global interpreter lock and having to. What's it called? What's the? It's not uh, a Python. It's something else. No, I, I, I have, I'll have a look. Okay. I think it's done by somebody from facebook or oh, something coming right. from that direction well wait when max bernstein here doing some facebooky thing with compilers and python it was here like last week or something yeah but i believe they do a re-implementation of the python yes well right and then you you dribble in your your changes into your you're still sharing you're well still sharing cliff you're still mm. sharing i'm still sharing <laughs> Perhaps ah, it's uh, clicking around randomly while sharing. Gotcha. Yeah. Stay away from Pornhub. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. No, for example, I'm going for the share, the stop share button now. Here it is. Yeah. Please. Could it be uh, uh, Sam Gross? I, I'm. I I, I did mm. a Google search, and uh, but that's 2021, so it could be that that effort already mm -hmm. died, and we have another one. Mm. Um, like no but them, but... There is a new proposal, 2022. <laughs> uh, that's from Larry Hastings. Mm. Yeah, all right. Not sure there are their efforts and. Uh, in the end, uh, Python exposes way too much stuff to ever be fast, as long as they don't uh, change the semantics. The uh, don't uh, um, decide on keeping the uh, interpreter internals uh, away from uh, native code. And yeah, right. Hmm. Yes, hmm. love or hate it. Some of the things Java did there are kind of reasonable. Hmm. They wrapped all access to objects from native code. So you always had the indirect. And then in the beginning, everyone cheated on it anyhow. And then they got burned enough times that everyone finally took the wrapper and paid the price. And then native code in Java worked reasonably well. Hmm. Yeah. But you had to, had to pay an indirection hmm. cost for the garbage collector. All right, what else? Okay, shifting gears. What would you say the polymorphic type? You had something. Sorry, what? The polymorphic, the polymorphic return type, or we, we oh, spoke about it. I was going to claim done on polymorphic return types. Okay. You could, you could, you know, mm, go I, more down that path or whatever. I, I have, I'm not trying I, to resolve. I have, yeah, I don't have over further thoughts about it. Type mm -hmm. result resolution on arguments, not on returns. Yeah. It's typically, it has to be it, uh, it's the way it's done. Mm. Now we know why. Maybe. Mm. Yeah. All right. If no one else has got nothing, we'll be quick and easy. I'll go get lunch. <laughs> it's early. Mm. I, I, my sleep schedule is all messed up, and I'm hungry now. From whatever's going on. Hey, you haven't heard my mood in a while. Oh, wait, it's Simon just bailed and wants back in. What happened mm. there? Boom. We have two Simons. Welcome back. On my screen, I still have two of you showing. Uh, yeah, I, I closed the wrong terminal window and that killed my Zoom. So, um, on the notes, um, where I uh, recently um, talked about um, having a better separation between uh, languages and language runtimes and operating system. I finally found a talk I've been looking for a long time. I first thought it was a blog post and I didn't manage to, uh, to find it. And then uh, somebody uh, told me it's a video and it's um, about, I think it's, it's uh, done by Andrew Kelly, who also does SIG. 
and um, it's called Year of the Linux Gaming Desktop. And um, the title is not that it's not that serious, but uh, um, what he basically does is say, okay, uh, we want to have a single binary, we want to run it, and it should just work. And the problem is that in the binary there are all these paths to shared objects hard coded, and of course on different uh, Linux systems the paths differ. And the question is um, how how to get things working without having to hard code uh, shared object paths into the binary. And um, he shows uh, I'll, I'll I'll post the link. He shows an he posts an interesting approach where he builds a binary that can be run both um, statically and uh, with dynamic linking. And the first time you run the program, it starts itself uh, statically linked, tries to sort out where the libraries are that it needs for dy dynamic linking, and then does a exec VE uh, and runs itself again, but with the dynamically linked uh, uh, libraries resolved in it appears to work and uh, it's kind of uh, an interesting concept and I would would love to have more tooling support for that. Is it, say, say that again, it's like run it once in the hard way and then run it again. Sorry? Say it again, you, you run it once to do the resolution. Exactly. You just cache all the resolutions. Uh, no, no. Uh, it just it, it runs and um, figures out what the paths are, and then run uh, runs itself again dynamically linked. And if you run the program again, it does the same uh, the same run twice approach. So, yeah, you could do caching, but it's it wasn't part of the presentation. But, uh, yeah, I'd have to. Okay. So why aren't why isn't this thing like why are the name path names hard coded why isn't there just already the lookup yeah so i guess see people doing c stuff as That's usual cool. it's like uh some version of tools it's like uh, paths and now you want to yeah i mean it's like the, the story of computing is basically a very long list of reasons why we can't have nice things <laughs> Uh, yeah, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's 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 probably like that. I think we, uh, some C dude did it uh, like 50 years ago without too much consideration. And now uh, uh, everyone suffers, even those that do not use C in the first place. And... Yeah, yeah. Certainly, you know, if I go back 50 years, there's a whole lot of things that weren't around and weren't necessary to think about. And you had other things to worry about because your tools suck compared to where we're at now. And so you did expeditious things and moved on. Well, if, if it's all better, that's why we keep inventing new programming languages. That's it. <laughs> Correct. Mm. Fine. Yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, thought experiment uh, uh, saying, okay, um, uh, imagine every language had as much operating support as C has uh, by like having LD lying around and doing magic, uh, interpreting the things and fixing the binary. And um, it would be interesting to see how different languages use their uh, apportioned amount of power if they were allowed to do uh, things of uh, equivalent uh, complexity. Yeah, I don't know. There's a, I mean, the C is underwriting for many, many other language runtimes and including all the whole, you know, binary rewriting things and linking steps and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. It's still, I mean, there's plenty of languages that call each other by CFFI, despite the fact neither side is C. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So there's there's something to be said there about 
coming up with a, a, a I don't know, some sort of language thing that's trying hard to hide the layers without hiding it from the next guy who's wrapping you. Hmm. You want to call somebody and you don't care. You just want to agree on whether you're passing the first argument to the function and RAX or RCX or RDX, where the hmm. fuck it's going to be, no one cares. And you want to call Linux version X and Linux version Y for read, and it's a slightly different kernel call. It's a slightly different argument layout. No one really cares. So why isn't this all wrapped and hidden hmm. already? I mean, uh, on Windows, you have a uh, com, and it doesn't seem to be that terrible. Is that I don't actually do very much Windows programming. I do Java on Windows. In my life, I've done minimal amounts of Windows programming. Horrifically, I did some of the wrapping early, early on in hotspot days. I did some of the wrapping around Windows callback methods, but not a whole lot of that. Uh, 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 it's, it's, uh, I just had to uh, look up the abbreviation. It's component object model, and it exists since Windows. Uh, <laughs> 3.1 and uh, it basically exposes signatures in a language independent way and well it it works for decades already and i mean uh, c++ understands it and .net understands it and um, yeah it would be nice to have some kind of uh, abstraction uh, on Linux too, instead of having random C header files lying around and making everyone deal with it. I mean, the common object model is powerful. If you need to control a robot from a rich text document, like it's the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are we are scrambling around for something to talk about today, so. Mm. Maybe we should just call an early quit and, and be done. I did learn a lesson on the importance of having good syntax recently. Okay. I've been digging into the RDF world. Oh. And there's like Why? nine encodings of how to represent RDF triples. And do you want to represent them as XML or prefixed XML or JSON linked data or... <laughs> and it's like, yeah. If, you know, Lisp basically looks like Lisp did decades ago. But yeah. Data log, everyone's like, oh, we want to be able to do this data log stuff. But all the ways of writing data log and data log queries and data sets and oh. feels like no one's actually come up with a not painful way to do that kind of a triple store. Um, so, oh, wasn't that maybe, maybe you should go pivot to something like XML is, is sort of light and easy to deal with. So what you're, what you're trying to do, you're, you're looking into building automation stuff because most of the frameworks using RDF in some way or another. Um, so the problem is you want to have a lot of objects that are defined by some kind of schema that can be indexed by a generic indexer. But how does your generic indexer know like, this is a thing that needs full text indexing, or this is just a number, or this is an identity that you really shouldn't break into pieces. It's the whole string or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> no, hmm. not going there. Again, that's, that's against the static type system idea. The static type system always uh, includes guaranteeing that you get, if you get one object, it's the whole object, nothing in between. Right, but ultimately you can't stuff the whole world into one static type system. There is a reason that the web is a bunch of linked documents and not a bunch of linked SQL tables. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree like. that the, the static system is, cannot catch all the use cases in a program but it can structure in that way so you can get around it, that you can not write everything you want. So, I don't know. It's, it's the trade-off between the power of the language, what you can express and what you can rely on. And here, if you cannot rely on something be there, that's take off the expressivity of the problem. <laughs> 
So we'll yes, be... it's a borderline miracle that Google works <laughs> and can manage to index <laughs> everything. Yeah, but I'm sure that they had or they have their own nightmares doing supporting that mm, to the large extent. Well, they figured something out. Well, well, I think or two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. I'm, I'm going to declare victory here instead of rambling on for another hour. Mm. We'll uh, we'll meet again here next week and uh, see if we have some more exciting stuff to talk about. Yeah. All right. Till next time. Bye, Bye. guys. See you, folks. <laughs>